These notes are based on Chapter 5, which is entitled The Working Cell. We're talking specifically about the plasma membrane in this, in this first part. Notice here in the, in the micrograph, you can see the phospholipid bilayer that makes up the plasma membrane. The important thing about the membrane is that it controls what enters and leaves the cell. So what we're trying to do is relate the structure of the membrane to how things get into and out of the cell. Remember that the plasma membrane is a phospholipid bilayer with proteins embedded in it and is what we call selectively permeable. That means it allows some things to come through, but not others. Here are, are three diagrams of phospholipids. On the left, we have a structural formula showing the relationship of the, of the two fatty acid chains with the glycerol molecule, and here's the phosphate group with another group attached to it. This is a space filling model, and this model here is just a simplified diagram that you should be able to recognize from what we've drawn in class and what we've done as far as making our models. So if you haven't already done this in your notes, you need to draw this structure here and label the polar head and the nonpolar ends of the molecule. So you need to pause, pause, and then pick up right after this. So here's a phospholipid bilayer showing that the phospholipids are arranged in a double layer with their hydrophilic heads oriented to the outside and the hydrophobic tails located on the inside. The hydrophilic heads are the outside and inside of the cell membrane because both of those solutions, both outside the cell and inside the cell, are watery, water-based um, solutions that are going to interact well with the hydrophilic water-loving head. But the hydrophobic tails are going to form a seal that keeps the cell intact inside its membrane. So be sure and sketch a piece of the membrane, just about six or eight pairs of, of um, phospholipids and label the hydrophilic and hydrophobic layers of the cell membrane. So also in the cell membrane are proteins. There are various kinds of proteins that you find in the membrane. We're going to focus on three of them. The glycoproteins, which have a carbohydrate chain attached to them. These are like the identification tags or ID tags of the cell, identifying what type of cell it is. Then there are receptor proteins of various kinds in the cell. These are for chemical signals that pass back and forth between cells. And then finally, we have channel proteins, sometimes also called carrier proteins, that allow for transport of various kinds of molecules through the membrane. Notice also the yellow structures here that represent cholesterol that help give stability to animal cell membrane, but they're not found in plant cell membrane. After all, plant cells have a cell wall to help give structure and support to the cell in addition to the cell membrane. So why is all this important? <clears throat> well, one of the main things that living things have, one of the main characteristics that living things have in common is their use of mechanisms to regulate their internal environment. This is called maintaining homeostasis. <clears throat> Most activities in cells are arranged toward or directed toward maintaining homeostasis. This is the stable internal environment that is the desired state for cells and organisms as a whole. The cell membrane is the structure that is most responsible for maintaining homeostasis in the cell and consequently in the organism as well. So how does the membrane do this? It does this by controlling what enters and leaves the cell. And there are several mechanisms it use, uses to do this. Diffusion, osmosis, facilitated diffusion, and active transport. We're going to talk about each one in turn. <clears throat> so here are the terms defined. Okay? Diffusion is the movement of molecules from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Notice in the definition that is shown here, it uses the word spontaneous. This is something that happens because molecules are always moving. When they move around, they not bump into each other and bounce off each other like the, pool, the balls on the pool table do in response to the cue and the cue ball. So they, they're going to move and bounce around randomly from place to place. But they're generally going to move from an area where there are a lot of them concentrated together to an area where there's a lower concentration until eventually they even out throughout the whole system. Osmosis is a type of diffusion, but it is specifically the diffusion of water across a selectively permeable membrane, like the cell membrane. There are other membranes as well. But that's a good example of one. It's the one that we're going to focus on in our study. Facilitated diffusion is a diffusion of molecules that 
still are moving that from that concentration gradient from high concentration to lower concentration, but they have to move through the membrane by way of a carrier protein. The proteins make the diffusion easier for them because they can't pass, they're too big to pass through the membrane. Facilitated means made easier. And the final one is active transport. This is the movement of molecules against the concentration gradient from low concentration to higher, requiring an input of energy. Like it takes energy to swim upstream or to climb a hill, it takes energy to move opposite the way the diffusion normally occurs. Here is a diffusion grade, a concentration gradient showing diffusion. We have a high concentration of molecules over here on the right, a lower concentration on the left, and so the gradient goes from high concentration to low concentration. That's simple diffusion. It's like you spray perfume in one corner of the room. Eventually, those molecules are going to make their way over to the opposite side of the room, and eventually they're going to spread out evenly in equilibrium, filling the whole room evenly with the molecules. Now, how is osmosis different from this? Remember, osmosis is about water only traveling through a membrane. So here are some terms that refer to different kinds of solutions, water solutions, and when we're talking about osmosis in cells. A hypertonic solution is a solution that causes the cell to lose water. It loses water because the, con the solution that it's in has a higher concentration of solutes than the cell does. A hypotonic solution is a solution that causes the cell to take up water. It takes up water because solution has a lower concentration of solutes than the cell does. And an isotonic solution is one that causes no net movement of water into or out of the cell because it has the same concentration of solutes as the cell. The important thing to remember in all of this is that molecules are going to be moving both directions across the membrane. There will always be some moving both ways. But in a hypertonic solution, more of the molecules are going to, water molecules are going to be moving out of the cell than into the cell because there's an attempt to even out the concentrations by spread by sending the water across to the other side of the membrane. Same with a hypertonic solution. In a hypotonic solution, there are still going to be water molecules moving both ways, but more water molecules will be moving into the cell than out of the cell. In isotonic, there will still be movement of water molecules, but they're going to be relatively even uh, because the distribution is already even of the water molecules. So here we have a cell in a solution. On the left, we have a solution, at the solution outside the cell, and on the right, we have the inside of the cell. Notice on the inside of the cell, there are six sugar molecules and uh, about eight water molecules. And on the left, there are four sugar molecules and considerably more water molecules, 12 water molecules. So is this a hypertonic solution or hypotonic solution? Well, when we're, looking at the, we're looking at the sugar, not the water, to see where the, what the concentration is. Since there is relatively more sugar in the cell compared to the water, that means that the outside the cell is a hypotonic solution, so water will therefore move into the cell. It will reach equilibrium when the proportion or the ratio of water molecules to sugar molecules is the same on both sides of the membrane. The sugar molecules can't pass through the membrane, they're too large. So there, there's not going to be any movement of the sugar molecules, only of water. So we can't have equal distribution of the sugar, but we can have an equal ratio of water molecules to sugar molecules. Here we have a slide showing what happens to cells in various kinds of solutions. If you put a red blood cell in a hypotonic solution, water is going to move into the cell, the cell is going to swell, and eventually the cell may burst. This is deadly for the cell. Cells cannot survive with a broken cell membrane. In plant cells, it's not quite as dramatic. You usually can't see the rupture occurring like this, but the cell definitely swells as water moves into the cells. In a hypertonic solution, this is where you have a higher concentration of solutes outside the cell than inside the cell. The cell is going to shrink as water leaves the cell. This is called plasmolysis, and it's not very pleasant for cells either. And it can eventually lead to cell death as well. In a plant cell, you can see this much more dramatically this way because the cell membrane actually pulls away from the cell wall. 
And of course, in an isotonic solution, we have equal amounts of water moving into and out of the cells. So the cells are happy. They're at exactly the right solution, so everything is just fine. This concludes the notes about osmosis and diffusion. And the next part will concern facilitated diffusion and passive transport, active transport rather.